This week's episode of the Autoblog Podcast is brought to you by the Autoblog Daily Digest. It's a great way to stay updated with what's happening in the world of cars in just two or three minutes every day. Ask your smart speaker for the Autoblog Daily Digest to stay up to speed with the latest car news, or subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to the Autoblog Podcast. I'm Greg Migliori. Joining me today is Associate Editor Byron Hurd and News Editor Joel Stocksdale. We've got a lot to talk about this week. We're driving some pretty hot cars, a wide range of things here, from a Mini Cooper to a uh, kind of wild custom Hummer. Um, one of the old ones, actually, not the new one. Um, so that's kind of cool. A lot of things to talk about, too. Byron has a column about commuting which may be coming back if, you know, everybody's sort of health of the vaccines all get rolled out. You know, we might all be going to offices somewhat soon, maybe this year. And that means you got to commute to get there. Byron's got to take on that. We're going to give you a little bit of a retrospective on Big Red. This was an interesting piece out of the drive, actually. Uh, last week, we did our own kind of little read this on it. I think it's worth talking about. If you, if you didn't see it, do check it out. It's kind of a fun thing. Uh, we'll run through some news. Genesis X, pretty good name, right? Just uh, they kept it simple, uh, and it's an amazing looking car. Kia EV6, and then maybe we'll get to a few other things. So that is the show. Let's jump right in. The Porsche Cayenne Coupe. This is the GTS. That is one of my favorite flavors of Porsche. Joel, uh, what did you do with this Cayenne? Well, since at the time wasn't vaccinated and we're still in the middle of a pandemic didn't really get to do anything super crazy with it mostly kind of driving around town and driving it on the highway and stuff like like i want to do when i'm just driving aimlessly uh but overall it's like i'm not a huge fan of crossovers uh even performance ones just because it feels like a slightly silly thing like trying to make this top heavy and also just in generally heavy vehicle go really fast but i don't know there's there's something that about porsche that they just know how to make a car drive really really well it's borderline annoying because it seems like it's almost impossible for them to make a car drive badly it's like whatever they touch just is really good. <laughs> um, like in any Porsche, like the steering is really super accurate, uh, like perfectly weighted, offers decent communication. Um, like the engine in it is really, really good, super responsive, just snap the fingers like you've got boost. There's no waiting. It's really progressive. Um, it's just, it's a really great vehicle. Uh, this current one, it makes 453 horsepower and 457 pound-feet of torque, which they're not crazy numbers, but it it feels more powerful than it is. Uh, which, again, I think is kind of a Porsche trademark. It's like, the numbers aren't crazy, but once you get behind the wheel, it, feel, it feels like they underrate their cars. But yeah, the steering is great. Uh, actually, so one of the things about it, the way it drives, it feels like you're sitting on top of like a Panamera. The whole, it just, it reacts quickly. It has very little body lean. It's got lots and lots of grip, but you're sitting up high. And so if, it feels like you're sitting on top of a smaller Porsche, uh, just the way it reacts and everything. It's, it's kind of a funny sensation. Uh, but it's a good sensation. It, it's it's one of the few like performance SUVs that isn't just because like lots of performance SUVs can do amazing things. They've got gigantic tires, uh, loads of grip, all kinds of crazy suspension and traction settings and things that make it do really great things. Uh, but this is one that actually like kind of encourages you and feels good when you drive it hard not just that it's 
it's complying. It's like, it's, it's like it wants to be a part of the fun. <laughs> um, so just in general, it's really good. Uh, I, I was quite pleased with it. That's cool. I think the uh, Cayenne GTS is definitely, like I said off the top here, the flavor I would probably want in the Cayenne. Uh, I really like the GTS treatment. I feel like they they get it all in balance right. Um, <clears throat> you know, like your point there, Joel, the, the raw power isn't like crazy. Like, yeah, it's a lot of horsepower, right? But, you know, it's, it's reasonable. Um, Whenever I drive the Cayenne, I like the steering. I always like how they sound, uh, regardless of which, you know, motor you end up getting with it or which trim level. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, so I'm going to throw kind of a throw it across the infield here to you, Byron. Panamera or Cayenne, if you need a Porsche with just a little bit more functionality than, say, a 911 or a, a Boxster or something. Oh, man. I think I drove the uh, the Cayenne GTS... SUV, the non-coupe version, just this past fall or maybe late summer, and I'd echo basically everything Joel said about it. Like, it just, it's shockingly good, and honestly, I actually like the styling of the SUV a lot better than the coupe, too, so, like, that would probably be my pick of those two, but given the option of the Panamera, um, I think I'd go with the Panamera Sport Turismo, kind of split the difference, get the, get the hatch style, almost, not quite a wagon, kind of a wagon, not really a wagon, and then uh, just skip the extra height and all that kind of stuff and, and get the kind of best of both worlds. So they're, they are amazing, they're, especially the, the Panamera. It's just so sublime to drive. Fair choice. I'd go Taycan if money wasn't really quite in the equation here. Give me the, uh, the sedan with all of the electric power. But, you know, that's, that's column C, I guess, if you will. Yeah, I was going to say, that wasn't part of the original question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't think of it when I asked the question. Uh, I just thought of it now. Um, so, yeah. I, I think if it were me, I would be like Byron and I would get a Panamera instead. Uh, I think the Panamera looks a lot better, and I prefer sitting lower when I'm driving hard and fast. Um, plus, it's, it's less weight. Uh, it's less top-heavy. It'll, it'll be that much better to drive. Um, I think, though, for me, the question would be, uh, would I get the GTS, which is a bit pricey? The coupe starts at one hundred and ten thousand um, dollars, and like the thing that uh, I was kind of thinking about was I would maybe go with the Cayenne E Hybrid Coupe, which actually makes a couple horsepower more. It makes four hundred and fifty-five horsepower. And starts at eighty seven thousand six hundred dollars before destination. And the thing is, most of like the handling goodies and whatnot that were on my GTS that I tested are available on the hybrid. Uh, but the hybrid would have a little bit of plug in range, which I mean, it's not much, but it's a little bit. And I would feel a little bit less guilty driving um, such a, an expensive, slightly wasteful SUV. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting when you start to talk about these luxury crossovers and then how expensive they are. Because I always have this this like dissonance. Like, well, if I want a Porsche and I'm going to spend $110,000 on it, well, give me a 911, you know, Um I just that that's always what I default to. The one exception I would make is I just, you know, wrote up the DBX, the Aston Martin crossover. And my thought was this is really good at being an Aston Martin and a crossover. I could see people legitimately saying, yeah, I want a crossover. I want an Aston Martin. I'm going to do this or I want an Aston Martin. This is what I want because I don't really want to. Um, you know, drive a Vantage or DB11 every day. So, you know, I can sort of see that argument, but I mean, yeah, the, and the crossover coupe is another kind of interesting, like, layer to the argument. Uh, like, maybe the SUV body style, yeah, you know, again, it's a little more practical. Yeah, there's a lot of things to peel back on the onion, but it sounds like what you're telling me is it's fun, does the job, and don't overthink it, maybe. Yeah, and I mean... Even though I kind of think I might go with the hybrid, I will admit the V8 on the GTS sounds really, really good. 
really good. It's just, it's yeah. got this deep kind of guttural noise and it makes nice little pops and crackles on shifts. It's, it's a really good engine. And so it's one of those things where it's like, on the one hand, I could save a lot of money and have something more, uh, environmentally responsible or have something that makes silly noises. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's actually a tough choice when you're talking about a Porsche because the yeah. cars do sound pretty good, you know? And I mean, how much are you really saving the environment with your hybrid Porsche? Right. Probably a little bit. So, um, cool. Any other thoughts on the Cayenne? Um, I guess one other thing. The one that I had had the uh, lightweight performance package, which... Uh, I don't have the number right in front of me. Hang on a second. Uh, but basically it gives you like a carbon fiber roof and, uh, comes with some of the sport pack stuff. I, I remember it is an expensive package and I don't think it's actually worth the money because yes, it'll save you some weight and technically make it faster and maybe a little bit better handling on the track. But are you really going to take your Cayenne GTS to the track? Really? Like <laughs> if you have one of these and you want to do track stuff, I feel like you probably have a Boxster or a 911 or even some other sports car, maybe a Corvette or something um, that you're more likely to actually drive on track. So, and on the street, I really don't think you're actually going to notice the lightweight package. It's uh, you're just not going to drive it hard enough to really to really make it worth your while. Yeah, the the lightweight sport package, the base one, is nine thousand one hundred forty dollars. Um, wow. And it, it gets you a couple other little things, but you can get those separate from the carbon fiber roof and whatnot. Oh, except it does get you the houndstooth seats, which are pretty fantastic. <laughs> um, and I would admit would be difficult to pass up. Uh, so I guess that would, uh, that would, that, that would be kind of tough. I mean, uh, I'll say <laughs> the houndstooth is always tough to pass up. Like when you can get seats like that, I mean, it's just like with the, uh, what is it? The tartan and the GTI when they yeah. offer something like that, how do you not get it? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the city weave or whatever it is in the new Volvos, which is, I think also somewhat environmentally friendly is an extra little boost, oh, but that's interesting. That pretty cool. But the thing with both of those is that those just come on the base car. Those are those are the standard options. Yeah, where you don't have to spend of, nine grand, <laughs> right? And what's also kind of annoying about that is that like virtually everything on a Porsche can be ordered a la carte, except this. <laughs> it's like really, uh, yeah. I don't know. I think I think I would make myself give up the houndstooth as much as it would pain me because it's like it's not it's not worth nine thousand dollars. Or and the performance gains you're getting aren't like skip the lightweight package. If you want the handling upgrades and stuff, you can get those a la carte and you can still save a decent chunk of money. Um, because like you're not gonna get the you're not gonna go that much faster with the carbon fiber roof. So save the money, get some of the options a la carte, uh, spend the rest on track days or something. <laughs> Sounds like a reasonable, uh, reasonable solution i guess to that dilemma if you will um briefly i'll jump into the uh, mini cooper countryman this is the uh i don't know the crossover sort of of the mini lineup if you will or one of them uh, it's got four doors let's put it that way had some fun with it um mine had that uh that kind of white helmet top thing going on uh, again it was the oxford package so it's kind of a good deal um I noticed the steering a lot. You know, I think last week on the pod, podcast, we were talking to James Rizwick, our West Coast editor, because he was in an actual mini, like two-door hardtop. And he made the point that this is, or that was the first, like, like mini, if you will, he had driven in about six or seven years. Um, geez, I don't know when the last time I actually drove the, like, the mini, if you will. 
But I, I think the countryman, you know, effectively communicates what Mini is in a little bit of a bigger package. I ended up putting like over 100 miles on this car, which I don't drive that much these days. Like if I'm doing a review, I have a route, you know, it's usually about 50, 60 miles. And then I just try to like uh, ramp up some more like or log some more miles on the car to like, you know, feel everything out. Uh, but this was just, I did a fair amount of driving, went into downtown Detroit, um, went all the way up north, like not up north, but north of the city, if you will. Um, it was fun. It really was like, it's been a while since I have driven any flavor of mini. So, you know, things like the brakes, the steering, the chassis, the look, it's all still there. Uh, you just, do you mind having those extra few door, extra two doors? Okay. You know, I... I'm willing to do that. And I could even see myself thinking, man, I really want a mini, but I just, I can't do with the two door, you know, and I need something that's a little more substantial. And that's where a car like this comes in. Uh, picked up groceries, picked up takeout. There's not a ton of room in the back, but I used the trunk, you know, like legitimately used it. Um, it's definitely, I'll use the cliche, like, you know, flingable in the corners and things like that. I'll resist the urge to say that it handled on rails, but, um, you know, it, it had many of the dynamics and things you would sort of expect from a Mini. Um, and in that sense, it was a lot of fun. The interior, I think, was a little... I feel like, and I'm curious what you guys think, I feel like Minis have gotten a little more conservative with their interiors. Granted, the Oxford uh, package is a little, a little more basic, but... There wasn't anything crazy. There wasn't like the openometer that you might remember. This wasn't convertible, obviously. But were th there weren't those kind of like fun, frivolous, extra things that really um, dress it up in this one. And that was a little disappointing. But um, yeah, I mean, it was fine. I actually got a car seat in the thing, which was, I would have thought that might be tricky because it's, you know, again, not a very big vehicle, but it was pretty easy. Um, it's attractive too. You know, people... People took note of it. People, you know, walking by were like, oh, Greg's got a Mini this time. You know, they're, they always notice when the cars like um, change, if you will. And a lot of people noticed the Aston Martin, but, you know, people didn't not notice the Mini. Let's put it that way. So, you know, it's, it's doing what Mini needs it to do, if you will. Um, it was kind of like a nice refresher for me back into the Mini brand. Because, again, it's been quite some time since I've driven... Uh, really any flavor of mini um you know that was about it i don't again i don't have i guess super strong feelings of it but um uh mine had the 18 inch wheels led headlights um inside the seats were heated uh it had the automatic transmission which you know i i like to have a mini with a manual that just feels right but um and it was also pretty stiff you know march is a month when you don't really want to be driving over some of Michigan's broken roads, uh, but we have to. And a Mini is really not the car you necessarily want to hit a pothole or a rut in. Um, and it lived up to its reputation. When you hit a hit like a rut in the road, you really feel it, but that's okay because that's how it's supposed to be in a Mini. You know, you're supposed to have that really um, dialed in chassis and, you know, stiff suspension and all of that. So, um, I don't know, any mini thoughts? Obviously, I drove the car, you guys didn't, but any just thoughts in general, like where you think mini is at right now as a brand, that sort of thing? I honestly feel like I kind of missed the boat on the prime countryman years because I think for a while when it was when it was first introduced, you could get the S models with the all four, which is their all-wheel drive, and a manual transmission. And I was just looking through it. It looks like that's basically been eliminated up and down the lineup by this point. It's kind of like the Jeep Renegade in that regard, because you did first couple model years, you could get all-wheel drive and a manual in that. It was kind of like a fun little hot hatch slash baby crossover. And those fit kind of a weird little niche that now just doesn't really seem to exist anymore. So uh, I'd, I'd still like to actually get into a newer Countryman, but... I don't I don't feel quite as compelled as I used to. Yeah, I have complicated feelings about the countryman. <laughs> it it does deliver on a lot of mininess. Like it does handle pretty decently. It's got the look. Um it's got like even though I do agree that uh 
interior wise, they're not quite as quirky as they used to be. I mean, the speedometer is now right in front of you instead of being <laughs> in the middle. The middle is now just for infotainment and also the little LED ring that shows like climate settings or tachometer or whatever you want it to display. Um, but I just, I also feel it's like the worst mini. <laughs> it's by far the heaviest and that's a little bit of an issue when it uses the same engines as the littlest minis. So whereas like you may have a standard, like the regular mini with the base three cylinder and a manual transmission actually feels shockingly zippy for something with less than 150 horsepower. Uh, you put that in something that's a five door crossover of reasonable size it really kind of blunts the feel and the same goes for like handling and ride. It just, none of it feels quite as sweet as in a normal mini or even the Clubman or even the five door hard top, which is, which is a thing. So like if you want a classic mini experience, but just need that little extra space, they do have the like slightly elongated mini hardtop, which I think is probably the sweet spot. And if you need even more space, there's the Clubman. Um, and both of those have the slightly lower feel and don't feel quite as big and cumbersome as the Countryman. Not that the Countryman is really that cumbersome, but compared with other minis, it's the worst mini, <laughs> I think. <laughs> um and the other problem is that I feel like the Countryman is expensive for what you get. Um, I don't think the interior is really all that nice. It's fine, and it's got some neat styling things, but I don't really feel the materials are all that amazing. 100% um, right there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's not huge on the inside. And so it's one of these things where I kind of feel like, if you want a premium crossover, I would strongly advise looking at like a Mazda CX-30, which has a very upscale premium feel inside. And it also drives really, really well um, while costing a whole lot less money. <laughs> and now you can get it with a turbo engine, too. Uh, so the Mini doesn't have an advantage there anymore. I mean... The, the John Cooper works does make 300 horsepower, which is more than the Mazda, but it also costs a whole lot of money. Um, so yeah, I've, I've got complicated feelings about the countryman. It's, I think it's, I think there's a case for it. And I think for some people that just really, really like really want a mini that they just love the style and love kind of the image around it. Uh, but they need something more practical. It, it's still a solid choice, but I think it's, I think you can do better if you don't have to have that specific combination. I agree with that on multiple levels. And I think if you don't have to have a mini is how I would probably distill it. There's better options, but mm -hmm. if you want a mini and then you actually want a little bit of car around you, this translates pretty well. That was my kind of takeaway, if you will, was like, well, because I, I'm not a huge mini guy. I mean, they're always memorable cars to drive when they come to the press fleet. Um, it's just, you know, I like I didn't grow up like saying Mini Coopers are my favorite cars, you know, because we all have our like favorite cars, if you will. Uh, I certainly respect the brand and all of the like the racing lineage and all of the great things they stand for. Um, but it was never like a car like that I had on my like, you know, wall, like a poster or something as a kid. So I guess, I mean, that's good. You come to it with a very neutral approach, I guess, is how my approach would be. But so that's where like the countrymen and the clubmen, I kind of can come at them like, well, you know, it's yeah, it's not exactly like the traditional mini, but you do get a little more car around you. And I, for one, like that. Now, if that's not your prerogative necessarily. Like it has to be a mini. It becomes more like just another option on the shopping list. And I don't know if you have cameras going on over here, Joel, but a Mazda CX-30 like is literally what replaced the mini in my driveway. <laughs> so um, 
that'll be, you know, you've given me a lot to think about because I think those are two sort of like enthusiast tuned crossovers that, you know, certainly could be cross shopped. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's the mini. Let's talk about this Veloster that you have been driving, Byron. Uh, which one, Veloster? I assume this is, is this the manual or the automatic? Tell us about it. So this is, this is the, the new Veloster N, which, so this is the one with the new dual clutch transmission, which is really the whole point of us driving this, because we, we, we'd driven the regular Veloster N a couple times already previously. But for, I guess it's 2021, they added this new dual clutch, and they also, they upped the price on the car and baked in some of the performance features and made them standard. So... It costs more, the automatic adds even more to that, but you're getting more car for the money. I was blown away by how fun this thing was to drive. I had high hopes for it, and it completely exceeded my expectations, because I was a, I owned a Mazda Speed 3 for six years. I also had a Ford Fiesta ST, so like turbocharged front-wheel drive, hatchbacks, definitely my wheelhouse. And it was every bit as fun to drive as my Speed 3 ever was, and actually felt more put together, which surprised me to a degree, because the Veloster to me has always felt like it's kind of been almost there, and it, at first it was an okay engine and a decent set of seats strapped to a suspension that could not figure itself out, and then the next generation came around, they kind of like, they fixed a lot of the suspension stuff, but the steering wasn't quite there. But with the N, they were like, well, we're just, we're going full enthusiast. We're going to have fun with this thing. It's very direct. It rides a little stiff, especially once, like, once you put it in track mode, it's miserably uncomfortable. It has adaptive suspension. The dampers firm up, and it will rattle your teeth out if you're going over potholes. But when you leave it in the normal, like, comfort and even sport modes, it's actually pretty easy to live with. It's a little loud. I mean, it's an enthusiast car. You're not buying this because you're, you know, selling houses in a business suit all day and then occasionally taking it for a brisk drive on the weekend. That's just not what it's for. But if you just want a practical little car that you could turn into like a weekend track rat or autocross car while maintaining all of that same day-to-day -day kind of livability, it's a really good compromise for people who don't care as much about creature comforts. Because this one, like, it it should have been effectively loaded because you really can't add too many options to these. And it had some of the, like, driver assist stuff on it, but not, like, a full-blown, like, highway semi-self-driving system or anything like that. It did have lane keeping, and it did have basic cruise control, but I actually had to, like, pay attention because it wasn't adaptive. It was just... It was simple, and I liked that about it. Even with the dual clutch, which probably wouldn't be my pick, it really impressed me. Um, and it also has a little, it has this gimmicky little thing they threw in just for the dual clutch model that they call the end grin shift. And the idea is it's literally just a button on the steering wheel that you press and it kicks you into the lowest possible gear for the speed you're going and gives you an overboost from the engine. So you actually get a little extra torque for that. So it's supposed to be like a quick button to get into a passing gear with the most available torque and you just hammer it and go and get it over with. It only lasts, I think it's less than 30 seconds. I don't actually recall off the top of my head how long it remains in overboost, but it's very brief. And the idea is that you're supposed to, you know, use it, lose it, and then move on. And it's a neat little gimmick. I don't think I'd ever actually use it in daily driving because if I'm already using the DCT, I'm probably just going to flick the paddle a couple times, grab a couple gears and go. I'm not going to, you know, remind myself where the button is on the, on the steering wheel. But it's kind of neat. A, a cute little gimmick just to throw in there for the people who maybe don't want a manual transmission or for whatever reason can't have one and just you know want that that little like instant downshift moment that dual clutches aren't actually all that good at because there's so many gears especially and because it's got to work its way through them to get where you want to go so it's neat um but as a as a broader package man I, that thing was so much fun i haven't had that much fun in a car like that since I sold my Speed 3. So I'm very impressed by that. What year was your Speed 3? It was a 2008. It was okay. the uh, refreshed first gen. Nice. So it was a Metropolitan Grey Mica, which, uh, oh, love that thing. It was that kind of greenish gray. It was similar to the the guard color that Ford did on the Mustang and then a, oh, a couple other cars. I think the Fusion, maybe the Focus even got that for a couple of years. But it said that, you know, in the, in a, 
cloudy situation. It was gray, but the sun came out and there'd be some green sparkle in it. It just looked very pretty, very similar color to that. And that was actually the same color that I bought my Mustang in. I liked it so much. So the, uh, the verdict is definitely uh, positive there. You sort of sound like the target market for this car in many ways. Um, you know, somebody who wants an enthusiast machine like that. I, uh, yeah, the Speed 3 was a very iconic car, if you will. We had a long-termer when I was back at Auto Week, and it was an 08, 09. I forget what exact year it was. Uh, bright red, it was just an amazing thing to drive. So much fun. Such a great uh, shifting car. That Mazda manual uh, for that time and that place, it was brilliant. Um, yeah. But uh, Veloster is definitely, I think, sort of assuming the mantle of, like, maybe where the speed three left off, you know, um, yeah. there's a bit of a gap right now, um, in this, like, this is, I would say a legitimate hot hatch. This isn't like a medium spicy yeah. one. This is, this is the, you know, the hot sauce, if you will. Um, yeah, it's definitely so. more like Honda Civic type R than it is Volkswagen GTI. There's no getting yeah. around that. It's, it's, edgier it's louder it's less comfortable than a gti it's it's less well-rounded but it's it's for two different buyers like and it, it, you said that this basically pegs me like 10 years ago it's the car i would have purchased without even thinking about it and the the gti has always appealed to me i've owned volkswagens like up and down that road but every time it came time for me to actually buy a car i ended up finding something else that just felt a little bit more fun and not coincidentally, those have usually ended up being Mazdas. So, you know, it's, it, I'm a bit of a fanboy, but at the same time, like, I'm not shopping for any Mazdas right now because they're not offering something like the Veloster N. So, you know, the, the, the pendulum keeps on swinging, right? Like, you know, sometimes it's one OEM, sometimes it's another. It's yeah, sometimes the sweet spot's just a moving target. GTI is definitely a car I can see myself buying again, like without even thinking, like using your just example there. Um, but I would also agree, like as I've driven GTIs over the years, you would drive one and then inevitably two weeks later, something else would come through and you're like, well, that's a little bit more fun, you know? And maybe that means the GTI would be better from an ownership perspective because you might just enjoy it day in, day out, week in, week out for years. Whereas a Speed 3 or something, Type R, you know, maybe you get tired of having that much of a workout every time you need to run to the post office or something, you know, so. Yeah, I 100% agree. Well, and just to kind of echo a lot of these sentiments, because I've, I've driven the manual transmission Veloster in, and I mean, like Byron said, it is a phenomenal car to drive. I... And just, and even though they got rid of like the super base, like lower horsepower one without like the fancy differential, that's fine. You probably didn't want that anyway. And the thing is this, in this current form with the standard performance package, it's still a lot cheaper than a civic type R by, I think about five grand and you're getting probably 90 to 95% of the experience. And in some ways it's even better because you actually have genuine customization of drive modes on the vehicle. So you can mix and match uh, what stuff you want. Like if you want full bore handling, but you just want it to be quiet while you do it, you can have that setup. Uh, you don't have that option in the Civic Type R. And now the Civic Type R very annoyingly pumps in fake engine noise. Um, when you pop it into like the full R mode, it's, I, I'm very bothered by that. Like <laughs> granted the civic type R could use a little bit more, uh, vocal personality, but not that way. <laughs> uh, and like the Veloster, you, you can have it so that it doesn't pump in any artificial noise. Um, and it has that awesome, uh, active exhaust system that makes amazing real noise. It's, it's just, it's, an, it is one of the biggest performance bargains out there. And if you, if you're looking for a car like that, you should really, really consider it. And personally, I think it looks awesome. And uh, the U S is one of, if not like the only market that gets the inversion of the Veloster, which I think is really cool because it's a really unique looking car 
and it's the best version of it and you can't get it anywhere. It, it's a, it's a neat car. I, I have a real fondness for it. Um, and I, I wish more people would buy it. Yeah. I drove one last summer and yeah, and I, I agree with you guys just how fun it is. But I mean, there's one of those cars that you wonder how long, how long it's going to live. You know, I mean, it's, People need to buy them. The audience is already going to be pretty small. It's like literally the three of us are people who like are would at least have it on their shopping lists. Um, but then you kind of reach a point where like everybody who's going to get one probably has one. And then what do you do? So um, I don't know. I do think I do think offering the dual clutch transmission will expand that for sure. Buyer yeah, base, yeah. though, um, because there are going to be people that like have an awful, awful stop and go commute. And I mean, they can really only afford to have the one car and they don't want to work out their left leg every single day. Um, so this would give them that option while also being able to like shift really quickly and have a car that they can have fun with at the track. So I think it is actually a good move for Hyundai. I hope that they don't get rid of the manual transmission in it because the manual transmission one is a lot of fun, but I think this is a good move for Hyundai and it sounds like they executed it well from what Byron has said. It's been a while since I've been on a track, probably for most of us actually. Um, but this is, would be on my top five list of cars. I would like to get out on a track, do a couple laps, um, just feel what it can do. And there's actually, like I said, it's been a while since many of us have been on tracks. Uh, so that list of cars, I'd like to see what they could do on a track is getting quite long. But I mean, this one's just built for that sort of situation, uh, especially with the dual clutch where you could like then you're not even thinking about like shifting. You're just like steering brakes, looking at the track, getting super dialed in. Um, you know, stuff like that could be a lot of fun. You know, I think really just. Um, I'm, I don't know, at this point, I'm literally just kind of having visions of different tracks I was on where I had that experience. Um, so we should probably come back to the presence and talk about, uh, uh, a customized Hummer that you drove locally, Joel, uh, tell us about it. Yeah. So it is the mil spec M one R and mil spec, uh, kind of got their start by resto modding Hummer H ones. They would tear them all the way down to the bare body, strip the paint, uh, redo them with a uh, Chevy Duramax LBZ 6.6 liter turbo diesel V8, um, big beefy axles and suspension, uh, fender flares, like a bed liner coating on the vehicle, um, add some niceties like uh, better air conditioning and leather seating and stuff in the vehicle. And uh, we drove one of their first ones, let's see, two or three years ago now. And, and it was really good. It was a lot of fun. And the M1R is their first of what they're kind of calling their second generation run of trucks um, that will all generally be called M1. This is being called M1R because they, the company that the, uh, let's see, what, what was, what was the engine company that was building their diesels? Um, they're a local diesel comp, they're a local diesel engine builder, uh, to Detroit. Um, but this particular one has been upgraded with, a uh, bigger, uh, turbocharger turbine, uh, bigger injectors and stuff. So the output, um, when it's fully finished is 800 horsepower and 1300 pound feet of torque. No, wait, 1200 pound feet of torque. Um, either way over a thousand pound feet of torque. It's a lot. Um, and it's, it's just goofy, goofy fun. Um, this particular version uh, has been finished in a bright, bright yellow with contrasting uh, black trim and stuff. And the interior, which they do the in, they do the interior all in house. They actually started doing uh, private jet interiors. They recently got uh, certification from FAA to start doing that stuff. Um, it's black and yellow with di with black diamond stitching and. It's it's a very loud vehicle. Uh, 
but the, they pull it off. It's got very nice looking wheels on it. Um, and one of the big things that they've improved for their M1 run of vehicles is uh, all the switch gear. All the switch gear is made of uh, machine built aluminum. And it feels really, really nice. They've got these nice clicky toggle switches for doing the uh, windows and switching on uh, lights and things. It's got aluminum knobs for the air conditioning. And now the air conditioning actually has multiple settings for fan speed and temperature. Uh, whereas on the previous one, it was basically it was on or it was off. And that previous one just had like kind of cheap off the shelf plastic toggle switches um, and kind of plastic vents. So the aluminum switch gear and the aluminum vents, the upgraded HVAC. They also gave the driver a little bit more space by getting rid of the lever shifter and putting in a push button system and also a new steering column to give you a little bit more knee room. So it's a little bit roomier. It's got better ergonomics. Um, and all those interior upgrades will be offered on the entire M1 line. Uh, not just this special M1R. Uh, and driving it around, the the engine is... We, we actually... I drove it basically a week after they finished assembling it. And so the engine was still, in, was still being broken in, and they had, the t they had the engine tune turned down a bit for break-in period, and they didn't have it fully worked out. But... We it's it still gave a good impression. Like that turbo, it may it sounds like a jet engine as it's spooling up. It's just it's it's so loud and so fun and like once it once the boost fully hits and it can make about thirty five pounds of boost, the thing moves and it just keeps moving. It doesn't stop pulling. It's and it's such an eerie sensation when you're driving like a three or four ton truck to be going as fast as you can in it. Um, and even when it's out of boost, it's not as fast, but that big V8, that still has enough that it gets it around town pretty easily. Significantly better than any stock H1. Um, it is a bit of a handful. The steering is uh, not super precise, and you've kind of got to stay on top of it. Um, and it's got the uh, it's got a rod haul racing long travel suspension on it, which is an optional upgrade. And it's a little bit softer and more comfortable than the last one, but it also introduces some more body rolls. So the whole thing, I don't know. It feels like it feels like trying to ride like a Great Dane puppy. <laughs> it's big, and it's got a lot of energy, and it's a bit of a handful, but it's also just a lot of fun and makes you smile. Um, I I I really like it. The this M1R it is very expensive. The, this particular one with the special engine and the customized interior and the optional suspension it came out to four hundred and twelve thousand dollars. But whoa, that's yeah. crazy! It is. I uh, sorry to interrupt there. I couldn't even <laughs> believe how much money that is. <laughs> I feel like I have to do a shot. Like <laughs> wow. All right. Go ahead. But, but let, but let me put it into perspective. You are getting a vehicle that has been restored from the ground up. It's been hand built by a small company, and you're probably not going to run across another one of these. And it can be customized right to your specification. Um, and it's just it's a really unique driving experience, and I think that's kind of the key thing for me is that. This doesn't drive like anything else, and that's what makes it really special to me and, like, is why I would actually be okay with dropping that kind of money on it. Because, and the thing is, you could probably spend a similar amount of money on, like, a Rolls-Royce Cullinan, which has its own set of virtues. It, it would be a lot more quiet and a lot more refined, um, a way fancier interior, but you can get that from a lot of luxury luxury vehicles. This Hummer is something unique and special, and and I think that counts for a lot. And on top of that, uh, the base like M1 starts at around three hundred thousand dollars, and I really don't think you would need the the long travel suspension 
Um, and I would be happy with a more mundane, cheaper interior. And the other thing is the, the 500 horsepower, 1000 pound fit of torque, just basic engine is more than enough. And honestly, with that smaller turbo, it spools up a little quicker. It's actually more responsive and I think more fun around town. Um, so really that, I, that would probably be the one that I would get anyway. It's also the one that they kind of want to be making more of because they said that, uh, they had fun doing this sort of like extra boosted engine, but it's not really kind of what they're looking, they're looking for. They, they want to make more sort of like OEM feeling vehicles and they don't want to, they don't want to get trapped into that whole spiral that a lot of diesel people get into where they just keep adding more and more boost and they don't care about emissions and they roll coal everywhere. They, they want to stick to making something that is uh, like emissions compliant. Um, and actually they said that in the next few years, they, they want to start looking at some kind of like alternative fuel, maybe electric kind of thing. They're keeping an eye on how things are developing. They, they haven't seen a setup that they like quite yet, but that's something that's on their radar, which I think is kind of neat. An electric Hummer. Sounds like a good idea. Um, maybe, maybe somebody's <laughs> going to try that. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, gosh, imagine if, man, imagine if there was a new one of those. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Can't believe that. But let's run through some news things now. The Genesis X, uh, this may be the prettiest car I've seen this week for sure. Uh, Joel, you wrote the story. Uh, real quick, impressions. It's so, so, so pretty. I like it so much. <laughs> they need to build it. They need to build it now. If you check um, your calendars, this should have been the week of the New York Auto Show. At least traditionally, that's when it is. This would have been a car that would have been like shown literally like tonight probably at some trendy club in wherever soho or something and we'd all be drooling over it uh because it's impressive it's just it, it one of the things that just strikes me so much about it is that it's a much more like old school design it's it's not some trendy fastback it's not a crossover this is a classic coupe or even you could you could maybe even classify it as like a two-door sedan because you can clearly see it's got that three box design you've got the kind of box for the front end you've got the box for the passengers and then you got the box for the trunk it's all rounded and super elegant but like you can you can see that it's got that setup and it's just it's low it's long it's wide like you could almost see it coming out of like the 60s or something um, even though, I mean, it's got lots of modern, it's got a lots of modern modernity to it also, but it's just, it, it's, it's very, it's, it's an instant classic design. Like it's just, oh, it's so nice. <laughs> yeah. I get very strong, uh, Buick Avenir vibes mm. off this thing. And now I'm just hoping that we don't get a repeat of Avenir since that just became a trim package. But, um, yeah, that thing is gorgeous. I love it. And like it looks like they could be producing it. It's not it's not super outlandish. It's actually got a it's actually got a nose that looks a lot like what you would find on the new G70. Um it's I mean sure it's got concept touches like the super slim rear view mirror cameras and it doesn't have a lot of cut lines, it doesn't have visible door handles, but other than that, it looks like it could be a production car. And I guess that's one of the things that is so weird that they said nothing about what powers it, except that it's electric and that's it. doesn't say anything about like a hypothetical range or hypothetical power or hypothetical motor layout. Just this is a pretty electric thing we made. <laughs> this does. Yeah, and I'm fine with that. Yeah. I was going to say this, I'm a hundred percent okay with it. And this does remind me sort of of those concepts that you would see a lot of times at like the New York auto show where it's like, here is this gorgeous concept, and then you really never hear of it again. Um, a brand, sometimes like Kia, sometimes like Genesis, would they show these amazing concepts? And you know, again, sometimes you hear from them, sometimes you don't. Um, I do wish they had maybe been a little more specific. That would give me more hope that there might be something, you know, more at play here. I don't know what their business case would be for a car like this. I don't care. Uh, your headline right there is perfect, Joel. Seriously, build it or I guess your subhead, but 
I digress. That's what they should do. It's a great looking car. Um, and like, I, I think you could make a case for it as like a flagship halo. Like this is what we are. This is what we can do. Kind of vehicle. Give it like the absolute craziest, best electric powertrain you can, like the most power, the most batteries, the best range. Sell it for like a crazy amount of money. It wouldn't sell a lot, but it would be it would be a real attention getter. And it would it might get people into showrooms. And the thing is, Genesis has really good normal cars. And so you would go in there and you'd be like, Well, I can't afford this, but like Ooh, their sedans are really nice. Their crossovers are really nice. It's not it's not a case of like you see the new Chevy Corvette and then you go <laughs> in and like you well, like I guess I could afford an Equinox. Nothing against Equinoxes. They're perfectly fine. But <laughs> but like if you were to go into a Genesis dealer and you can't afford the Genesis X, but you see their SUVs and stuff, it's like, oh no, this is actually I see I see the brand connection. I see that these are nice and luxurious as well. Like this is I would be very happy to drive this instead, even if it's not what I would dream of. Well, this reminds me a little bit of some of those Cadillac concepts from Pebble Beach, mm-hmm. maybe five, six years ago, CN, CL, um, just those like kind of gorgeous old school Grand Touring sort of style, you know, just really beautiful cars. And I, the one part of this that I think I do see some realism is it looks like the rest of the Genesis lineup, like, mm-hmm. I mean, in concept form, but I mean, it's it's gorgeous for what it is and the type of car and segment it would aspire to play in. But it's like the GV80, you know, I mean, the, the, the other Genesis vehicles don't look that different from this from the front. So I think that alone right there gives it a lot of credibility and I don't know, gives us a lot of hope. So mm-hmm. keep it in the Hyundai Motor Company family, the EV6. This is pretty good looking car too. This is the, uh, Tesla fighter. I don't know. Is everything a Tesla fighter at this point? Right. Uh, electric car, a uh, number of different flavors here. Uh, all wheel drive, front wheel drive. Uh, it's sort of like the sibling car of the Ionic five. If I'm remembering my nomenclature here correctly, I think this is the better looking one, quite frankly. Uh, they put out some new specs on it. James Ruswick, West coast editor wrote the story. Uh, but I, I think this is pretty good looking here. I think this is uh, could be a bit of a game changer for Kia, uh, especially the GT line looks pretty good. Um, what I actually find interesting about this is that you can actually get it with a relatively modest power output and range. You know, you're talking like 168 horsepower. That's not really crazy when you look at some of these EVs and their crazy like ratings. Uh, this one has 258 pound feet of torque. Um, that's fine. Nothing special, but okay. But you can, you know, upgrade and get more range, more power, um, which you, know, you don't often see. You know, Tesla has some of those options, um, but it's not like a widespread thing. A lot of companies are like, it, it's almost like it took them everything they had to get to the finish line to get like an EV. And then they don't give you all these different flavors. I, to me, right. this is impressive. That they're like, well, what do you want? You know, do you drive far? Do you drive fast? What do you need here? So, um, yeah, I mean, that's my thumbnail opinion. And yeah, this it's no Genesis X, but it looks pretty good. Yeah, I appreciate that it's it looks it looks like its own thing, which is pretty neat. Uh, and like you said, the powertrain spread is wild because the base one is only 168 horsepower. But the top end GT one, it makes 577 horsepower. It, that's a crazy, crazy spread. And it's a, yeah. it's a much bigger spread than its sibling, the Ionic 5, uh, which has between 215 horsepower and 302 horsepower. Um. Yeah, it's 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 not what I was expecting. I was expecting basically a duplicate of the Ionic Five uh, powertrain offerings, but it it is not that. It is it is kind of its unique setup of powertrains. It's it's interesting, 
And I have to imagine that there will eventually be an N version. Like, it feels like it's got to come along, right? But That's a good point. And you could definitely have the Ionic 5 in with that 577 horsepower setup. Um, but I guess the other thing that I'm wondering about is, like, how is it going to be priced? Because... Um, <laughs> I guess I'm expecting the Ionic 5 based on its specifications and kind of rough size. I'm betting, and also range, I'm betting it'll probably be sold at close to like the $40,000 mark, give or take a couple grand, which would be in line with the Nissan Aria, the base Ford Mustang Mach-E, and the VW ID4. Um, and with this Kia, I, I don't know, maybe the base one might come in under the Hyundai Ionic because it's got actually less power than the base Ionic 5. Um, but then the GT might be like 60, 70 grand, kind of up there with the Mach-E uh, GT. It's going to be interesting. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I mean, I think it's it's interesting this approach with the EV6, the way they're kind of almost one-upping what Hyundai is doing. We've seen this sort of the sibling rivalry between Hyundai and Kia. And, you know, I've been on press trips where they say, no, we are separate companies. And we're all like, yeah, sure, whatever. Okay. But every now and then they sort of surprise you with this like totally different approach to a similar segment. And again, it may be a matter of months here before we see the rest of Hyundai's like rollout with their EV strategy. But yeah, I mean, they're key is going for it here. So yeah, I've I've heard some stories that that they are part of the same company and they share a lot of stuff, but they also operate surprisingly independently of each other too, um, and sometimes a, a bit competitively. It's it is an interesting dynamic. <laughs> um, it's like General Motors brands in the '60s. Yeah, yeah, it. That's that's actually, I think, probably very close to what it's like, because they have a certain amount of autonomy, but also still need to kind of share from similar parts bins. Cool. Uh, so so real quick, though, uh, which do you get? Which do you guys prefer? Kia EV6 or Hyundai Ionic 5? EV6 all the way. Yep. Same. 100 percent. Even sounds cooler. Yeah. I, Yourself. I think I may still be leaning a little bit to the Ionic 5. Don't don't get me wrong. I really like the EV6. I think it looks really good, and I appreciate that it is trying to be kind of its own thing. But I don't know. There's something there's something about the Ionic 5's like proportions. I kind of dig the sort of like old school hatchback look. And I like some of the lighting cues. I don't know. But hey, I, I may change my mind when I actually finally get to see them in the sheet metal. Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, I'll tease this out. The uh, Ford Bronco is going to be appearing at the Easter Safari uh, coming up. Uh, just uh, we have a story on some of the concepts they're bringing there. Check it out. Traditionally, this is a Jeep event, although really, even though Jeep is sort of owed the marketing, it's really an off-road event. It's a 4x4 event. You know, um, if you've ever done a trail, uh, if you've ever been to Moab or you've ever done like the Rubicon, there's Jeeps, but there's literally everything with like four-wheel drive is there. I mean, it's, it's crazy the things that you see there, uh, most of which are not anywhere near stock. Let me put it that way. So um, Ford's going to crash the party a little bit this year. Check out that story at our site. Check out some of those pictures. For my money, the Jeep stuff still looks a little cooler this year just because they've always had these special concepts. These Broncos kind of look like, hey, we're going to do some tuning and show up. But um, yeah, the Broncos look pretty cool too. So let's uh, transition here to real quick, kind of throw it around the room. We've had a lot of stuff going on about like small-ish trucks lately. Uh, Santa Cruz teaser went up from Hyundai. Kind of neat looking teaser. Uh, we also got uh, a little bit of info on the VW Amarok, which really is a, I mean, the art was good, as we like to say in the journalism world. Uh, that really stood out. Some spy photos of the Ford Maverick, um, which does bump up a little with the, you know, the Ranger, which is going to share the next gen Ranger, which is going to share underpinnings with the, the Volkswagen. So 
you know, just as you guys look at the landscape, we'll just toss to you there first, Joel. I mean, who's well positioned? What do you think here? Which of these trucks caught your caught your eye in the last week? What do you think? So, you know, I guess I'll I guess I'll start off right now with VW Amarok. Um, I think it's a good move for Volkswagen that they can get Ford to kind of develop their truck for them. It'll uh, probably save them money and get them a really good truck. Not not that there's anything wrong with the current Amarok, but I mean Ford. I mean Ford's been doing trucks for so long and in global markets, uh, and they I mean, they they do know their truck stuff. Um, I wouldn't count on seeing the, an Amarok in the states anytime soon. And I, the reason, the reason for that is if you are new to the truck scene, it's so hard to break into that market. Um, and I'm not, and I'm not just talking about like Honda Ridgeline, which has always struggled. It, it has additional things to overcome the fact that it's kind of sizable, but it's a unibody based pickup, um, that doesn't have a traditional like low range transfer case and stuff. Those are things that it's got to overcome. But even even back in the 90s, when Toyota was trying to get into the full size truck game with first with kind of the weird midsize T100, I owned one. Um, And then with the first Tundra, which was closer to being full size, still a little bit small, but but it took a long time for Toyota to break into that market. A long time, a lot of money, uh, just a, it, a big commitment to really genuinely compete in like the truck market. And the same with um, Nissan in the mid two thousands with the Titan, and they're still struggling uh, to sell the Titan in the full size market. It's it's a hard thing to do, and. I think with compact trucks, it would have been easier a long time ago when it was kind of dominated by Toyota and Nissan. But it's a lot harder now that both Ford, Ford GM, and even Jeep, they they have really really competitive options, and especially with an Amarok based on the Ranger, you've got the issue of why wouldn't I just go buy the Ranger with a Ford nameplate that I know that has a dealer in my hometown, um, and like it's a Ford. It's not some kind of fancy frilly European thing. Like there's, there's a reason that the Cadillac Escalade EXT and the Lincoln Mark LT and Blackwood didn't really succeed. Truck buyers want like a truck truck. They don't want, they don't want to seem kind of fancy and that they don't, that they don't get dirty. Like, a like any other red blooded, tough American, like, <laughs> The, the, there is an image issue, um, I think, if Volkswagen were to try to offer a truck here. So I, I just don't think the Amarok is is a viable thing for the U.S. It's interesting because Mercedes, uh, their former CEO, Dieter Zesha, said the same thing. He, I was in an interview with him uh, a few years back in the basement of the auto show here in Detroit at the time, and a room full of reporters Everybody's like, well, hey, this X-Class is the coolest thing since sliced bread. Are you going to bring it here? And he's like, no. And he, excuse me, he's like, well, I was the CEO of Chrysler, you might recall. Uh, And everybody's like, yes, of course. (laughs) Um, And he's like, I know what it takes to make a truck. And there's no way we'll make any headroom, head headway with this thing. He's like, yeah, it's cool. It'll work in some overseas markets. But um, those are markets where Mercedes are also used as police cars and taxis. Um, He's like, here, we don't do that. Here, people aren't going to even get what this is. And he's like, no. He's like, if you want a luxury truck, you load up your Ram or your F-150. And it was, I mean, he was a super blunt guy. And in my mind, he was one of the better CEOs of Chrysler and of Daimler uh, the last 20 years. I think he did a really good job. Um, It was just definitely an act of straight shooting. And I think that actually will apply to this VW truck here. Um, and we'll see how the new Ranger is. I I like the existing Ranger, but I mean, part of me is also like, man, this thing feels old, you know, it's... Um, yeah, it's, it's got a little it, age on it. Like the interior kind of feels old and like it, it looks like a truck that's been on sale for a long time. And I do agree. 
Yeah, yeah. And it's still a really good truck, but it, you, you can tell that it's got a little age on it. And so a new one, I think, will be a good thing. Any thoughts on this segment there, Byron? I think the most interesting thing for me is going to be watching what happens with the Santa Cruz and the Maverick and what that means for what car-based trucks are going to do. Because right now, I mean, you look at it, that's basically a segment of one in the United States, and it's the Honda Ridgeline, which is a midsize, so it's Ranger-sized, where Santa Cruz and Maverick are theoretically both going to be smaller. I mean, we already know Santa Cruz is. We had the spy shots go up today. It's got a Tucson interior. It's on the Tucson platform, effectively. So, yeah, it's going to be a little bit longer, but it's going to be small. And Maverick looks to be going that exact same direction. It makes me wonder whether Honda might come back and say, okay, well, you know, Ridgeline's never really done gangbusters for us here. Maybe we should think about downsizing it to compete more directly with these other trucks. And I think that might actually be kind of a win for everybody because ever since the old, old Ford Ranger went away, we don't really have cheap small trucks. We've had cheap in midsize in basically the Nissan Frontier, which is more a product of its age than it was its intent. And I think that especially the introduction of the Maverick, because it's a Ford, might generate enough gravity, if you will, to kind of pull the rest of this car-based truck segment into a more well-defined niche than what we have now, where it's Ridgeline is a midsize pilot with a bed. Sorry, that's what it is. And, you know, like, okay, we, we truck down the interior a little bit to make it feel a little bit more rugged and, to, you know, make it more affordable and things like that. But still, that's what it is. And without another point, you can't draw a line, right? So it'll be interesting to see, like, as that segment gets populated and actually congeals into something recognizable, whether that's going to have an impact on Honda. And so that's that's the most interesting aspect of that for me, I think. Well said, well said. Uh, one of the more interesting things I've read this week is your column, Byron. So I'm just going to kind of pass it right back to you. Uh, you kind of touch on as we kind of perhaps come out of this pandemic, people start driving again, you got to commute. Take it away. So my thought here is basically that we should take the lessons we've learned from the pandemic and try to apply them going forward in ways that make it easier for everyone to get their heads around real change in terms of like carbon emissions and everyday habits and things like I mean we've got the pandemic is terrible on so many different levels but if we just say okay it's over let's move on let's not take any lessons from any of this and apply them going forward then i think that's a waste and we've seen the world reduction in carbon emissions from people commuting less. We've seen insurance rates go down. There have been some opposite trends. Traffic fatalities are up, and that's mostly just because there's more space for people to do stupid things. And also because there, uh, apparently there's been a, a, a large uptick in impaired driving, which I guess people are bored <laughs> that's not, you know, it's terrible to laugh at that. But I mean, if you're just getting drunk and going for a joyride, that's not good. But we're on the cusp of moving past quarantine, lockdown, pandemic, normal, whatever you want to call it. And I think I've already seen chatter from some companies that are saying we actually like the dynamic we've experienced since lockdown started, since we sent everybody home. The work from home thing actually does work for a lot of people. It won't work for everybody and it absolutely will not work for every business. I'm not gonna sit here and say, well, we should keep restaurants closed and we shouldn't reopen bowling alleys and all this kind of stuff. No, absolutely not. We need, we do need to get back to normal, full stop. Not, not arguing that at all. But we can take the things that worked and apply them going forward by allowing more remote work, by pushing more for internet infrastructure that allows people in more remote areas that don't have good internet service to work remotely. Like there, there are issues here and we can solve them as they come up rather than just saying, oh, well, pandemic's over, go back to the way it was. Let's get everybody back in the office. I think it's short-sighted. I think we should take this opportunity to push for bigger, 
more enforceable policies when it comes to labor in general, and just embrace the fact that there's really no downside to having fewer people driving to work every day. I don't think people should stop driving. I don't think people should sell their cars. I certainly don't think the government should take anybody's car, whatever that means, because the premise is stupid. But we're we're sitting here staring this whole thing in the face, and if we just let it fly by, then it's a huge blunder. So I think there, there are a lot of opportunities here to explore. I know that at, speaking for our company, I, we've always had kind of a flexible working setup where if you needed to work from home, you work from home. And as long as your job allows you to do it, I don't think there are nearly as many obstacles today as there were even a year ago to making that a long-term solution. So, you know, we can, we're going to, people worry about having empty office spaces in, in urban areas or even larger suburbs and stuff like that. There's your free market opportunity, collaborative workspaces more retail, more whatever, things that, you know, the, the space will be filled. Those those places aren't going to go completely empty. They're desirable for a reason. They'll remain desirable. So, you know, commercial real estate, don't at me, but we can do something with this. We can make something good out of something awful. And if we don't, I think we'll regret it for decades. So that sounds... yell at somebody, call I... somebody. <laughs> or leave a comment on Byron's article. The uh, uh, I, I think it's a really interesting take. I think you know you mentioned all the. We have learned many things about how we work over the course of the last year. Uh, some of it good, some of it not. Um, you know, I, I don't know about you guys, but I um, in the new world order. Um, my my vaccine is scheduled hopefully for this weekend. Knock on wood. I know a couple of you guys are uh, going to get it even before that, and that's great. Um, you know, I look forward to like driving to work, driving the different cars, but I also look forward to thinking, hmm, I don't have any meetings this afternoon. I'm going to drive home and I'm going to take the long way in my, I don't know, we'll say Genesis X. We'll say that's in production by the end of the year. And I want to take that home because I don't want to sit in rush hour from five to six on Interstate 696. You know, that isn't a good use of my time. I could be at home. I could work for another half hour and then I could be eating dinner probably 45 minutes before I'd actually be home. So um, we'll see what the new world order brings. Check out Byron's column, leave a comment if you're so inclined. Um, you know, we love feedback. Real quick, Big Red was unearthed. Uh, this is the Ford turbine truck from way back in 1964. The Drive did a really excellent piece. We'll give a shout out to them. Uh, Joel, you did a nice write up, just kind of riffing on it for us. Uh, real quick here, before we spend some money, what is Big Red? And it's back, apparently. Yeah, so Big Red was a concept turbine engine semi-truck that Ford built back in the 1960s. And it was actually one of a lot of turbine truck prototypes that Ford worked on. But this particular one was the one that like went to the shows and had the awesome mid-century futuristic uh, design scheme. It had a pair of trailers that matched it. It had this crazy cockpit with huge windows and a view outside. And um, for the 60s, it was a super plush truck also because it had um, a passenger seat that would basically recline flat. And it had a little sink and a drinks dispenser and a little oven for like TV dinners and things. Honestly, a lot of stuff that you would see in modern semi trucks. Uh, but somewhere along the line, it got lost. And uh, and again, we'll mention like the the main story. Uh, you can you can link to it through our read to this post is done by the drive. They're the ones that did the heavy lifting and tracked down where the truck is. And there's a guy that owns it. And he even got it restored, and it's fully functional. It so it the truck lives. The trailers have been lost, but that that's not too big of an issue. They were just kind of like lightly modified normal trailers. So really, you could have replicas made up if you wanted to. But the key is is that the real truck exists. It still has a turbine engine that works. Um, the the thing that's a little bit sad is that. Um, 
you can't see it. Uh, the guy has it in his private garage. He wants to keep a low profile. Um, and the truck is crazy heavy and it's kind of, and it's a complicated thing to run it and you don't want to like break it. You don't want to crash it. Uh, so it's hard to get it out. Um, I certainly hope, and I'm sure a lot of other people would hope that he could somehow set up an arrangement with like Peterson or Henry Ford or uh, one of the other big automotive museums to find a way to have it on long-term or even possibly permanent loan so that people could actually see this truck. Cause it's really, it's really super cool. Um, and like the story of how it got lost too is kind of crazy because, uh, it got worn out a lot. Um, eventually it broke down and it was left at, uh, Holman Moody, one of their shops. They're the big time sixties Ford racing team that had Ford backing. And then there was a big falling out between them and Ford, uh, and Ford wanted a bunch of their stuff. Like Ford just like cut them off um, cold Turkey. And at the time the truck was still in Holman Moody's hands. And eventually Ford came back. and was like, Hey, we forgot you had this. We want it. And Holman Moody was like, no, we're keeping it. Um, and in part because they had a statement that's from Ford that after all of the cutoff and the frustration, Ford was like, listen, whatever, you, if you have anything else of ours, just keep it. We don't care anymore. And so that's kind of how it got out of Ford's hands and then went on its big, long journey. But again, check out the full story at the drive. Um, we've got it linked in our read this post because it's, it's a crazy story. It's an awesome truck. It's, it's well worth your time. Let's spend some money. Uh, this week's uh, letter comes from a longtime listener, Sam. Uh, he says the, uh, that Miata is not the answer uh, for this particular question. Uh, by the way, Sam is a longtime listener back since 2010, uh, back when we still announced episode numbers. This one's 672, if you're still listening and still counting. Here's the situation. Again, Miata is not an answer. Just sold his second Miata in 06 Grand Touring. Nice car. Uh, have boosted the previous NB and NC and had a 2.5 liter swap in it. It's kind of interesting, right? Um, I love this line. Now I'm just bored and Miatas have tripled in price. Good time to jump ship and make some money. Sure, I agree with that. Um, looking for the next obsession uh, to put in his, gar his garage. We could warrior to take on the twisty hills of central Pennsylvania. Here are the must-haves. Somewhat reliable, convertible, preferred. Uh, this is a request of uh, his 10-year-old, so that's cool. Kid getting into the hobby a little bit here. Needs to have great aftermarket support. $18,000 maximum budget. Here are the candidates. First-gen Boxster or Boxster S, uh, but a huge fear of the IMS failing, which is a known issue. Um, E93 BMW 328 or a 335 convertible. Nissan 370Z convertible or coupe. Z4 3.0i. Dealer's choice. Ideally, he would like to have a four-seater so the whole family could go on rides. Two kids, two adults. But outside of the E93, doesn't really sound like anything is striking his fancy. Um, previously owned an Audi A4, but uh, it sounds like it fell apart at the 100 grand mark, which you're going to have to be willing to take a few miles here to fit this budget and what you're looking for. Byron, what do you think? Well... I just did the spotlight on this like two weeks ago, whenever it was. So I, I feel like you really can't have this conversation without talking about a Subaru BRZ or Scion FRS slash Toyota 86. I mean, you get the price is right, especially if you go for an earlier model. You get four seats, which is a bonus. It's You don't get a convertible, but I mean, you still get a fun little rear wheel drive car with a huge aftermarket following. Uh, you can boost it if you want to. You got lots of, lots of options for that, and they seem to be pretty reliable. Especially if uh, you already have one where you know the valve spring issue has been resolved, which is, as far as I'm aware, covered pretty much universally because it was an actual recall campaign. So even if it hasn't been done, you can get it done cheap. So uh, I don't hate the 370Z as an option in this, honestly, but. I think if it's me in this situation, uh, I'm, I'm looking at a BRZ. Good choice. Around the horn to you there, Joel. So my choice, I, I'm glad that Byron brought up the, the 8.6 cars because I was thinking about those. 
But I think my the car that I, jumps to mind for me is the Honda S2000. It might be it, it's right on that edge of that eighteen thousand dollar budget. Uh, but the S2000 is one of those cars that had me think like because i i have a miata i have a i have a supercharged miata byron has had miatas too um i think you still have one right byron yep yep, yeah still do uh so the s2000 uh i i've had the fortune to drive one at the mid ohio school they they have some for uh, autocross stuff and it's it's I love Miatas and the S two thousand was one of those rare cars that had me seriously thinking about trading for an S two thousand. They're really 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 good. They're super well balanced. The engine is so buttery buttery smooth all the way up the red line and like it, it, it's it's a stratospheric red line. Like the VTEC is a thing. I know we all joke about VTEC kicked in, yo, but like it, it is a thing. <laughs> it's not, it's not the same as turbo boost, but it is a thing. And the S2000 does have a really big aftermarket. Uh, I think the eight, six, I guess triplets since <laughs> there's the scion in there, um, might have a slightly bigger one. Uh, but the S2000 is up there too. You can, you can throw a supercharger on that. And, the thing is, you're starting from a point where it's got similar power to a boosted Miata already. So you're starting from that point. Everything else is going to be gravy from there. And it's just it's a it's a superb car. And I don't know of any like serious reliability issues with them. I think they're pretty robust, like most like like most Hondas tend to be. So I think that would be that would be my pick. Um <laughs> How about you, Greg? I'm going to go with door number two here. I like the BMW 328 or the 335 convertible. I like that era of BMWs. I, you know, think they're still pretty reasonable. I think they could be something that, um, you know, become more of an enthusiast uh, like option as a little bit more time passes. Um, kind of an easy choice for me. I, I, I've even been kind of shopping around for some of those myself just if you know you can find one on the cheap i'm not really in the market for one but you know i would start there uh see if maybe you can get some you know form and function out of your purchase which is kind of what you know sam lays out here in the letter so yeah three different choices s2000 love that car that's always an emotional choice for me i, I like the brz too but i would land on the bimmer here so that's all the time we have this week thanks for joining me guys stay healthy have fun have a good weekend send us your spend my monies at podcast at autoblog autoblog.com that's the website we all work for have fun out there we'll see you next week